And then, of course... Yeah. Yeah. This is slowed down a little. So. <laughs> but that first launch did, did take, a, take a while to get off the pad. It's a bit worried there for a second. I mean, when that took off, I was like, wow, I can't believe it took off. <laughs> that was my reaction. So I think it's uh, incredible that it, we, we took off twice last year. Um, I mean, even though I've been very you know, closely in, you know, involved with the Starship program from the beginning, um, and actually, like, I lived out here. This is my, my primary residence for three years. Um, this used to be a sandbar, basically, what we're looking at here. Um, and now it's got a, an advanced rocket factory and, and a gigantic launch pad, and we've got a whole bunch of rockets out there. Um, but I'm still amazed that it actually got put together and took off. I'm like, wow. Um, I mean, the a Starship is uh, more than twice the thrust of a Saturn V. It is by far the biggest flying object ever made. Um, and for, you know, with, with some upgrades down the road, it'll, it'll actually be, I think, probably over 20 million pounds of thrust. Um, and Saturn V is seven and a half. So it, it'll, it'll end up being three times the thrust of Saturn V. Um, and it's going to fly a lot. It has to fly a lot. So it's, it's going to end up flying several times a day um, from many different locations in the world. And I think there's a pretty good chance that it, it does Earth-to-Earth -earth transport as well. Because the fastest way to get from one place to another on Earth is, you know, to get from here to the other side of Earth is an intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, but just make sure you delete the nuke and add the landing part. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, that's the fastest way to get somewhere. Yeah, wow. And then uh, between flight one and two, we made a number of, of massive upgrades. So the, there was obviously a massive upgrade to the launch pad. Um, so we've got like our many Niagara Falls here. Um, I mean, the, the water pressure is so much that if it went straight up, it would actually destroy the rocket. That's how much water pressure it is. So it's like, wow. Um, and it worked. Like, oh, actually, went and looked at one of the first things I went and looked at after uh, the um, second launch was to check out the launch pad because obviously the, after the first launch we dug a pretty big hole. Um, <laughs> and um, and, and it, honestly, it looked like you could just—it looked like there was no damage at all. Like they, the, you could just launch again, basically, for the pad itself. Um, so it's great work by the team to radically improve the launch pad overnight. Yeah. The <laughs> people always like want to use the Statue of Liberty for stuff. Um, Statue of Liberty is not that big. I was like, yeah, I was like, been there. I actually climbed up the Statue of Liberty in the tiny staircase a long time ago. Um, but it, anyway, this this is a big rocket, um, and it will get uh, bigger over time. So, um, <laughs> yeah.
So that's, I don't know if you guys watched uh, Kong vs. Godzilla. Uh, it's like one of the most insane movies I've ever seen, but it's like kind of entertaining and it's sheer madness. Um, and um, the crazy thing is that, that our launch tower is bigger than Mechazilla. <laughs> and it's going to do basically like the same thing, but with the arms, you know, like catch the rocket. And when I, I tell people like, yeah, we're going to catch the largest flying object ever with giant mechanical arms. They're like, there's no way that's real. I mean, we could give it legs too. <laughs> just, just give it legs and have it tromp around. That'd be pretty cool. Um, so, <laughs> and then we're also going to build a second tower. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna, this is this is we're going to really be launching a lot, and up, and we're going to be upgrading one tower while we launch from another tower. So two towers is important. Um, and there, was, there, there are actually so many upgrades between flight one and two that uh, it would actually take it like hours to go through them all. Uh, but one of the biggest upgrades was uh, going from uh, hydraulic to electric uh, actuation of the engines. So that actually uh, saved a lot of mass and complexity. Uh, so, yeah. Um, the electric TVC, I mean, it, it, it was just, a, this is one of the biggest upgrades. We also massively upgraded the heat shield. The engines themselves were massively upgraded. Literally everything on the rocket was, uh, like, there might have been thousands of upgrades between flight one and two. Um, so really gigantic improvement between flight one and two, and also ma obviously many improvements between flight two and three. And then we've got, we've got a whole uh, development plan to, like I said, ultimately get to a fully reusable rocket that does over 200 tons to orbit on a regular basis, full reusability. Yeah, hot staging. I mean, hot staging was, was a change that was basically, I don't know, just really within a space of like th three or four months, maybe less, um, going from, or roughly that, uh, going from uh, previously just kind of like a separating the rocket without anything <laughs> uh, and to, to actually lighting the upper stage engines uh, while the first stage engines are still thrusting um, and not blowing up the ship, which is, that was an amazing achievement. So I was like, wow, that's, and it worked. Um, so I was like, wow. So, um, so then look, let's look at uh, flight two. Attention all operators on countdown one. This is the final go, no go for flight two of Starship. Again, our two zeros at 7 a.m. Central. Raptor one. Go. Raptor two. Go. Stage one. Go. Stage two. Go. Copy, go for flight. Clock is rolling. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have liftoff. So, yeah, big round of applause, guys. Wow. So, 
So Fly, Fly 2 actually almost made it to orbit. Um, so uh, in fact, ironically, if, um, if it had a payload, it would have made it to orbit. Uh, because the reason that it actually didn't quite make it to orbit was we vented the liquid oxygen, and the liquid oxygen uh, ultimately led to fire and an, ex and an explosion. Because we, we wanted to vent the liquid oxygen, because we normally wouldn't have that liquid oxygen if we had a payload. <laughs> so ironically, if it had a payload, it would have reached orbit. Um, and so I think we've got a really good shot of reaching orbit with flight three, and then uh, a rapid cadence to achieve full and rapid reusability. And I mean, the, kind of the mind-blowing thing is, like, there is an actual path that we are on to make life multiplanetary. Can you friggin' believe that? Like, what? <laughs> I... Yeah, we just gotta get it done before civilization ends, but but I, like, I think we, a thing is going to happen. Um, yeah, right here. So anyway, so in terms of getting there, we want, obviously want to accelerate the production and testing, um, get to a high cadence. Uh, you know, for, for any given technology development, there it is, um, you know, how many iterations do you have and what is the amount of time between each iteration? So every time we launch, we learn, every time we launch or do a test, we, we learn something more. So increasing that cadence of launching and testing. Um, and it's always better to sacrifice uh, hardware rather than sacrifice time. Like time is the, true, the one true currency. Um, so it's, it, the fa it's sort of the fastest path to, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, rapidly, re re rapidly reusable reliable rocket. Um, Yeah, so, um, and we've got, uh, yeah, a block, uh, sort of a version two ship uh, that will be more reliable, better performance, endurance. We've got a, a version three ship uh, design that will stretch that, that be even taller, <laughs> probably end up being, I don't know, 140 meters before it's all said and done, maybe 150 in the end, in, in, in length. Um, so, uh, yeah. So it'll be even taller <laughs> than it currently is. Um, yeah, and so with, with, flight, with flight one, the goal was not to blow the, the, the pad up and ideally get, get some distance, which we did. With flight two, it was to get past a staging. So we achieved the goal of getting past a staging and almost to orbit. And then flight, uh, flight three, we've got uh, well, we want to get to orbit, and we want to do uh, an, an in-space uh, engine burn uh, from the header tank and, and prove uh, the, that we can re reliably deorbit. Um, we want to do a tipping point uh, header domain uh, propellant transfer. Uh, this is uh, important for the uh, NASA Artemis program. And uh, we want to uh, also demonstrate the, the payload door for the sort of PES dispenser for um, Delivering the Starlink, the, the, the V2 non mini, the, actually, probably V, I guess, V3 technically, uh, but really, the really giant satellites to uh, orbit. Um, yeah. So, like I said, the, the, the mass orbit ultimately of Starship will be, you know, over time, I think millions of tons of, of payload to orbit. Um, so, it's, it, I mean, compared to present day mass to orbit, it'll be more than, more than a thousand times, I mean, you know, more, more than a thousand times greater than uh, mass to orbit currently. That's what it will be eventually, or it needs to be. Um, so we also want to demonstrate uh, on-orbit refilling. This is uh, very important for the NASA Artemis program. Um, so we're very proud to be part of the NASA Artemis program. I'm always in incredibly grateful to NASA for their support um, and for trusting us uh, to do, um, to take, take astronauts to orbit, to trans take cargo to the space station, and to be an integral part of, of getting astronauts back to the moon. Um, one of the other questions I get a lot is, did we really go to the moon? Um, I've gotten that from, from a lot of people, 
And I'm like, yes, we went to the moon. Uh, more than once, in fact. Uh, but the crazy thing is that it's been over half a century since we last went to the moon. So, uh, you know, that's the, I think what, maybe that's what causes people to be skeptical. Like, how come we, we can't go to the moon now? Um, it was 66 years from the first controlled powered flight of the Wright brothers in 1903 uh, to landing on the moon in 69. So only 66 years. But, you know, over, like 50 years have passed since we last went to the moon. Um, but now we're going to go back there, and we're going to go back there soon. Um, and we're not going to just go just, I think, like we want to, the next step, I think, is to build a, a, a moon base, like moon base alpha. Make sci-fi real. <laughs> Not to add, remove the fire part of sci-fi. <laughs> so, um, but now, what, but in order to go and land on the moon, one of the technical challenges we have to solve is uh, orbital refilling, where we dock the starships dock on orbit and transfer propellant. Um, now we've gotten very good at docking because we've we dock with uh, Dragon to the space station, which is actually more complicated than docking with our own spacecraft. So. We have a lot of expertise in docking, so I'm, I'm confident we will solve this, and we just ideally want to solve it, hopefully by the end of this year, uh, but certainly by, uh, by next year. Um, and that, that's a big deal. This is one of the fundamental technologies that's necessary um, to, to build a city on Mars and to have a, Mars, a moon base. Um, and then, yeah, we'll also be launching some very big satellites. Um, World's biggest Pez dispenser. <laughs> and we do hope to do this uh, by the end of this year. Um, and then, yeah, more about the NASA uh, human landing system. So, um, as I said, we're extremely grateful to NASA for entrusting us with a fundamental part of the Artemis program. Uh, we want to make sure we do a great job for NASA. Um, and, uh, and really, the we, like we are a very fundamental part of the uh, the Artemis program. So if we, if we do not succeed, which we will, um, but but we, we in order for the Artemis program to succeed, we must succeed with uh, with with Starship. Um, and um, like I said, we actually want to far far ex, far exceed what NASA has asked us to do. So so the we, we want to go far beyond the NASA requirements and actually be able to put enough payload on the moon um, with enough frequency that you could actually have a permanently occupied moon base. That's, that's the next really big threshold from Apollo, uh, is have, a, have an actual moon base. Um, I remember seeing this, like, I guess kind of cheesy sci-fi show a long time ago called Moon Base Alpha. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen that, but um, like the moon actually drifts away from Earth. Now, this is not going to happen, but, um, but it was a cool show, Moon Base Alpha. Um, but we need a real moon, moon base alpha, and we're going to do it. So uh, then, uh, yeah, as I was saying, the, this is the long-term goal. This is what we want Mars to look like, is uh, starships coming and going, um, an incredible, beautiful Mars city, and uh, a flourishing uh, civilization on Mars. Um, and... Um, you know, ultimately, we can transform Mars into an Earth-like planet with uh, terraforming. Um, just needs to be warmed up, really, and then you could it, it could be ultimately an Earth-like planet, and we could bring the life from Earth. We could, we could extend life from Earth to Mars, um, and really, it's, it has to be you know it has to be humans, I yeah, because uh, it's not gonna be the dolphins, um, so. But we can, bring, we can bring all the creatures with us, and we can ensure that life on Earth continues on Mars uh, even after Earth becomes unlivable in the, in the distant future. So anyway, I'll go into questions.